and clouding conditions. And then what we're going to do uh, after that is uh, something, a couple of really fun things that I have planned. So there we are. This is where we uh, led up to yesterday. And if you want to once again think of anemias or lack of oxygen comparing capacity, oxygen carrying capacity to peripheral tissues as either increased destruction or decreased production, here's the decreased production ones. And if you just want to memorize them on this list, you're stupid. Because when you think about it, there's really only three categories here, aren't there? They really boil down to the so-called B12, folate, pernicious, megaloblastic category, because they're all tied into It's defective DNA synthesis. And it's iron deficiency, the most common anemia of decreased production of ever. And then, uh, which is tied in closely with chronic disease. And then the so-called aplastic anemia. So all of these categories are all really good examples of decreased production. Hemolytic anemias, you didn't really have decreased production. You just had inadequate production and therefore early death. With the decreased production, you are having sort of, uh, you know, I guess, abnormal slow birth. Uh, uh, technically, the cells here would probably have a normal lifespan, but they are not being produced fast enough. So, without much further ado, let's talk about this first really huge category of what we megaloblastemia is. And these are megaloblasts that you see here like over here in here. And I think you probably know why the word megalo is in there is because look at the size of these nuclei. They are two or three times as big. They look like they are red cells because they have a lot of intensely blue cytoplasm, but the nuclei are really, really huge. And for lack of a, a, a better word, let's just say in all of these so-called megaloblastic anemias or what are commonly called clinically B12 folate deficiency anemias, or what was called classically as pernicious anemia. The one feature about them is that they all have these megaloblasts, you know, large uh, and sometimes lumpy, bumpy nuclei in, in the uh, erythro, erythroid series. And whether you want to call these erythroblasts or normoblasts or rubroblasts by various classifications, it doesn't matter. The red cell precursors are huge and lumpy and they are not being made properly. In addition, once they are made and the nuclei are extruded, and now you look into the peripheral smear, the megaloblasts with nuclei turn into macrocytes. So this is all megaloblastic anemias result in large red cells in the peripheral smear. So if it's a large, if there's a lot of large red cells, your overall MCV or mean cell volume will be increased. And even though the upper range of normal for MCV, if you remember, is about 94, often it, uh, it's usually well into the hundreds before you really start to see significant things. So to see 95, 96, 97 is not uncommon. But once you're like in 102, 103, you can probably say there's macrocytes. So all megaloblasts result in macrocytes. But not all macrocytic red blood cells are from megaloblasts. For example, uh, in liver disease, for some reason, uh, the red cells are often bigger than they should be, but they're not, it's not a megaloblastic anemia. The common feature for all of these first categories is that they're impaired DNA synthesis, and for all practical purposes, they're called anemias of B12 folate. Even though a deficiency of the vitamin is often and usually not the specific cause. So once again, here's the hard list. You know, if you want to torture yourself and be, excuse the word, stupid, uh, and want to just kind of remember this and beat up on your brain, you can. Decreased intake, inadequate diet, impaired absorption of the vitamin, lack of intrinsic factor in your stomach, which it, the B, vitamin uh, combines with before it's absorbed in the terminal ileum, uh, 
Uh, so if you have a gastrectomy or if you have a malabsorption state in your small intestine, because once the intrinsic factor combines with the uh, uh, vitamin, it's absorbed in your terminal ileum. So small bowel disease, stomach disease. If there's a, a tapeworm in your uh, intestine, it could be competing with the vitamin and therefore decrease absorption on the basis of a parasite getting preference for it. Like fish tapeworm is a really common, uh, most common one. Uh, if you have bacterial overgrowth in blind loops of bowel, which we'll get into, that could cause it as well. Or if you have like an increased requirement, like for example, in certain conditions, you just need more of the vitamin. Pregnancy is a good example, but there's other ones. And if you have the same amount of uh, regular uh, absorption going on. So anyway, this is a long list. And if you want to remember it, that's fine. But here's the better way to remember it. Just think of the normal kinetics of vitamin B12 physiology. You orally intake the vitamin, don't you? It's in just about everything, meats, vegetables, you know. If I gave you a picture of everything that has B12, it would look like the salad bar at Wendy's, okay? Uh, it then combines with intrinsic factor, which is a protein made in the gastric mucosa. This uh, vitamin B12 intrinsic factor then is then absorbed in a terminal ileum. So if you just remember these three things. If you have defects at any of these levels, inadequate ingestion, stomach problems, gastritis, stomach cancer, or problems with the small bowel, malabsorption, blind loops, tapeworms, this is the basically three things that cause these uh, megaloblastic anemias. And I prefer to think of it this way rather than this way because that's stupid memorization, isn't it? This is an understanding of the process, isn't it? So here we go. All megaloblastic anemias result in macrocytosis as well. But the difference between a megaloblast and a macrocyte is that a megaloblast has a nucleus and it's huge and it's in the marrow. And the macrocytes are regular blood cells. They're just bigger than normal. And uh, anything over 100 you like to investigate as a macrocytic anemia. If it's just a little bit above, who cares? Uh, so another thing to remember is that <clears throat> even though we consider this a uh, disorder primarily of uh, the red cell series, there's a lot of problems in the white cell series as well. So not only are the neutrophil, I'm sorry, the erythrocytes big and megaloblastic, but even in the myeloid series, the bands, the metamyelocytes, the neutrophils, they're also uh, big as well. In fact, you know, I made a joke with one of my friends, Dr. Cohen, a world famous uh, hematologist, by the way, who was the uncle of Mama Chaos, if you care about it. We were looking at a bone marrow someday, and I said, why does this megaloblastic marrow remind you of um, uh, the 40s? And he says, he said, why? It's because you see big bands. Get it? The band cells are huge as well, not just the cells in the red series. So there was a classical disease <clears throat> called okay, pernicious. I laughed, but I had yeah? my mic muted, so you don't okay, get well, <laughs> If you're all laughing with muted mics, that would make me feel even better. Uh, megaloblastic anemia is uh, what pernicious anemia is. You see leukopenia because of the abnormal production of in the white series as well, the myeloid series. Another thing is you can see hypersegmentation of the neutrophils peripherally in the peripheral blood. So example, if the average number of lobes per neutrophil nucleus is 3.5, which it is, by the way, if you wanted to count a million of them and add them up. In, hyper, in pernicious, pernicious anemia, you have hypersegmented. You'll see five and six and seven segments on the neutrophil often, but the overall average might be up to like between four and five. They're jaundiced, okay? They have neurologic problems in the posterior spinal tracts. So it has to do with sensation, doesn't it? They don't have enough stomach acid or they are achlorhydric. And let's just say that whenever you don't make enough stomach acid, that is, could very likely result in a pernicious anemia as well, simply because if your gastric mucosa 
is not making acid, there's a good chance it's not making intrinsic factor either. On the other hand, even if you have a severe gastritis or a gastric cancer, you know, you can have pernicious anemia. And because of that, they can't uh, absorb B12 properly, even if the dietary uh, intake is normal. So they therefore have a low serum B12 in their blood. And, you know, there's a test called the Schilling test, which I've done a million times because it involves isotopes. And what they do is they take uh, radioactive vitamin B12 and see how much you're peeing out the next day. And of course, if you're not absorbing it, you're not peeing it out. So these are all the classical features. Another thing is like when you are in the wards and you see patients and you order their CBCs and you can see their MCV is way above 100, you're going to go, oh, shit, maybe this person has a, a megaloblastic or pernicious type of anemia. So you'll wind up getting a blood test for B12 and folate levels. This is done very, very, very commonly. So if you want to separate the folate deficiency features from the B12, even though they're frequently combined, Whereas you're not likely to become megaloblastic with a temporary absence from B12. For some reason, the, with folate, you are. So people that are pregnant, for example, frequently get uh, megaloblastic anemias because their folate, for some reason, is preferentially taken up by the baby. So a, a dietary lack of folate will produce a megaloblastic anemia much, much, much more quickly than a dietary uh, lack of B12. And of course, you could think of the, uh, if you're not absorbing the vitamin as well, of course, the folate doesn't have anything to do with the gastric mucosa, does it? Sometimes anti-convulsants, birth control pills, and of course, chemo will result in um, megaloblastic anemias because of a relative lack of folate. People on dialysis will have uh, megaloblastic. And this is primarily blamed more on folate than B12. But for all practical purposes, again, if you think of them uh, together, you know, that's okay. So that was the first big category. We've got two, about two left. Next one is the most common anemia in the world. It's the most common anemia you'll be treating. And it's iron deficiency anemia. And this is a classical anemia. It's also an anemia of decreased production. And whereas the so-called B12 folate uh, MCVs were high because they were macrocytic, the iron deficiency anemias are microcytic. So guess what? I made a little mistake here, didn't I? That's another typo that I should have picked up. So therefore, they have like a low MCV. And they are also hypochromic. They have pale, anemic looking cells. They don't have enough hemoglobin concentration inside. So if you look at the smear, these cells are going to stale, stale, stain rather palely compared to normal people. But if you look at their MCHC, you'll see that's also low as well. Now we're going to go a little bit into iron kinetics. And I want you to understand something about iron here. I made this as the most simple, understandable diagram possible. Iron is completely recycled. You know, your iron is carried in the heme of your circulating erythrocytes. You know, when they get older, they go to the spleen to die. It's then taken up as hemosiderin. Okay, so you have this uh, kinetic balance between uh, your regular iron in the heme, your hemosiderin, and then a balance between the uh, hemosiderin that's stored in the liver as well as the, uh, I'm sorry, the liver makes a protein called transferrin, which then binds the iron to then feed into the marrow back into the heme. So this is a constant cycle, isn't it? And you get uh, iron, by having it in your diet, don't you? But the only way you could lose iron is by bleeding because F absolutely everything is recycled. So you have to understand what iron is because iron is a uh, molecule that's part of heme. You have to understand that transferrin is the circulating iron that feeds into your marrow to give it the uh, iron. You should understand hemosiderin. 
as being the main storage iron. And remember, we see them every place we see hemorrhage, like in the spleen, would always have a, like a lot of hemosiderin. But you also have to understand another fourth thing here called ferritin. Because ferritin is the thing that is, can be easily measured in your blood that carries iron. It's, it's separate from transferrin, okay? And it's a great test. So if you suspect your patients are iron deficient because they have a hypochromic microcytic anemia, you then order a ferritin test. And if it's low, you got the diagnosis, okay? So that's, those are iron kinetics. And uh, I hope I made them e easy because they're easy to me. Uh, who gets iron deficiency anemia? Assuming that there's enough iron in American diets, which there is, by the way, it's people who bleed. So here's what you do. A, a guy comes into your office, an adult, and he has iron deficiency anemia. You f refer him directly to the GI doctor. Why? Because almost all, let's say 90% of iron deficient men are slowly losing blood through their GI tract, and they don't even know it. With a woman, it's different because in a premenopausal woman, the most likely region she's iron deficient is because she's having uh, heavy menstruation or menorrhagia. In a postmenopausal woman, she's just like a man. Silent GI blood loss is the most likely feature. This is what you might see in the lab if you look at the smears of iron deficiency anemia. You can see cells here, many cells, not all cells, but they generally look paler. So there's a significant difference between the hemoglobin concentration in relatively normal cells versus these pale cells. Uh, and of course, uh, this would also uh, evoke the term hypochromia as a reflection of low uh, MCHC. It would also evoke the term microcytosis because a lot of these cells are a lot smaller than they should be or low MCV. And because there's a mixture of cells, some of them are pretty small, some of them are normal. There's not any really big ones, but because there's a lot of mixture and a lot of small ones, that makes a greater uh, spread statistically in the uh, uh, diameter of the cell, doesn't it? And whenever you have a wide variation in size of cells, that's called anisocytosis. Remember, and that's manifested by a high RDW, which is the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation over the mean, if you remember that, of the uh, diameter of the cells, if you wanted to measure them all. But that's what the computer does now. So here you go. Uh, serum ferritin, pretty much with, with a, a microcytic, hypochromic, anemic person with a low serum ferritin is iron deficient. Because many of these uh, patients wind up getting referred to hematologists, they also do bone marrow exams. In fact, the main indication for a bone marrow exam is any hematologic abnormality. Not only will the pathologist tell you that, but the hematologist will tell you that, mostly because they make a lot of money from sucking marrow out of the bones. Uh, but look, you see all of this blue stuff here? that's done on the smear, that's hemosiderin. If you see hemosiderin in a bone marrow, that patient is not iron deficient. In the iron deficiency bone marrows, there's no stainable iron. If you, even if you see a little bit, they're probably not iron deficient, but you don't start becoming iron deficient in your red cells until you basically have exhausted all of your marrow iron. And of course, on the left here is a H and E view of a bone marrow. You don't really know if there's much iron here because you haven't done an iron stain, but you can see there's a megakaryocyte here. There's a megakaryocyte here. There might be part of a megakaryocyte here, but all of these cells that you see that are very densely round and small, these are in the erythroid series. And all of these cells down here that you see that have more loose open nuclei, they're in the myeloid series. So you can probably get a pretty quick impression of this marrow as having an ME ratio as approximately one to one because you see like a lot of those. Uh, that doesn't mean it's iron deficient, but I just wanted to point that out to you.
Okay. Uh, here's another principle to remember. And I want to really simplify this because it's true. Failure of any major organ, liver, kidney, you know, maybe even, you know, lung and uh, heart indirectly will result in what we call anemia of chronic disease. The fact is when people have uh, widespread malignancies, when they have any chronic disease, like chronic autoimmune disorders, or if they have chronic infections, somebody that's been sick for a long time, this is almost a list of everything, is very likely to be anemic, and that's called the anemia of chronic disease. And so when you have patients coming in with liver failure, kidney failure, anything failure, you're going to say, well, they're anemic too. Well, if you want to work them up for iron deficiency anemia, you can. But remember, they're going to wind up having either normal or even above normal stainable hemosiderin in their marrow, whereas if they were iron deficient, they would have none. Otherwise, they're going to be anemic. They might even be hypochromic and microacidic. So remember, the anemias of chronic disease is a very, very broad category of just about everything, every really chronically sick patient. And uh, they uh, may look like iron deficiency, except they have hemosiderin because they're not iron deficient. Okay, now we'll talk about the last big category of anemias of in decreased production. These are the aplastic anemias. And aplastic means A means nothing, and plastic means growth. These are anemias in which there is not much growing in the uh, bone marrow. And um, most of them are secondary to common things like radiation, drugs, antibiotics, especially chemotherapy. Because remember, your bone marrow cells are the most, one of the most uh, fragile, uh, high turnover cells in your body. So if you're given chemo for something else, you know, the bone marrow is the thing that you're most concerned with. So what do they do? They monitor patients' platelets, they monitor their white cells, and they monitor their red cells when you're on chemotherapy. You probably know that already if you know somebody who's been on chemo. Uh, there's an inherited form of aplastic anemia called Fanconi's anemia, named after Dr. Fanconi, as you might guess. And it's the only aplastic anemia that's inherited and it's genetic. There's also a Fanconi syndrome, and it's totally different from Fanconi's anemia. And another thing that makes it weird is that Fanconi's syndrome, you would think would be the same Dr. Fanconi as the guy with the anemia, but it's not. In fact, Dr. Fanconi did not discover Fanconi syndrome. So don't ask me why. So these are the aplastic anemias. Another thing to remember is that you can have anemia. The aplastic anemias are not just selective to the red series. Usually the megakaryocytes are wiped out. The lymphocytes are wiped out. The myeloid precursors are wiped out. So aplastic anemia is really aplasia of everything, except for the case of what they call pure red cell aplasia, which is a pretty rare disorder, and I've only seen it a couple of times myself. And it means uh, only the red series are significantly suppressed in the marrow, and the other ones are going okay. But almost always, aplastic anemia is not just an anemia, it's also a thrombocytopenia and a... Uh, neutropenia as well. And as you might guess, here's a marrow of a patient with aplastic anemia. Now, if you remember from what I've told you and what we've seen in the lab a million times, we said that the average bone marrow is 50% myeloid cells and 50% fat. Well, look, this is about 90% fat, isn't it? And that's about 90% fat. These are the bone spicules. This is the marrow. And you can see it's almost fat. And in fact, it looks like you're biopsying a part of the marrow that's not supposed to have fat, like, you know, a long bone in one of the extremities. But this is, you know, probably iliac crest or sternum or something. So the common denominator for aplastic anemias is that the marrow looks pretty much wiped out. Sometimes 
there is a relative sparing of the lymphocytes. So when you look at a marrow of aplastic anemia, or if you were to identify most of these few remaining cells carefully, they're probably mostly lymphocytes. And that's because frequently the aplasia occurs at the level of differentiation where the uh, cells have already branched off from the lymphoid series. Remember in our differentiation tree, there's an early break off between lymphs and everything else. Well, usually the aplasia occurs in the everything else part of the tree. So sometimes the lymphocytes are relatively spared. What causes aplastic anemias? Well, I said Fanconi's is the only genetic one and it's usually toxic substances. In fact, when Everybody that is on chemo is at risk. It's not just one or two chemos. A lot of them, in general, chemotherapy in general suppresses bone marrow. A lot of antibiotics do. Uh, the, the mother of all antibiotics was a drug many years ago called chloramphenicol. It was a great antibiotic, and they found out a lot of people's bone marrows were being wiped out, even though it was very effective in treating their organs. So that's why it's not used anymore. Uh, insecticides, phosphates, and a few vi viruses like the EB virus. Remember the one that causes mono and the one that causes Burkitt's lymphoma. A couple of the hepatitis viruses do. And even in the herpes family, the VZ virus is, uh, has been uh, linked to aplastic anemias. Chemotherapy is so effective at wiping out your marrow that one of the uh, rationales is to take people's marrow or even stem cells from their peripheral blood and harvest them and then zap the patient with either massive chemo or massive radiation, especially in a lot of the leukemias. This is how they're curing a lot of leukemias, by the way. They're taking out stem cells. They are totally wiping out the marrow with radiation or chemo. And then when the patient has no marrow, they're repopulating it again with the stem cells. So sometimes uh, this can work to an advantage, doesn't it? You should also know there's an anemia, which I could barely pronounce because it has four consonants in a row. It's called the myelophthistic anemias. And that's just a fancy name for an anemia resulting from a physical replacement of the bone marrow by metastatic tumor. So the, uh, <laughs> so the uh, tumors that frequently go to bone, remember we said prostate, breast, thyroid, and renal are the four biggies, but they all do eventually, I guess. Uh, they're more likely to produce a myelophistic anemias. And in, in the process of these cells being replaced, they also have some abnormalities in the peripheral smear as well. Okay, we're done. We've already discussed the anemias, the hemolytic anemias of increased destruction. We went over the major categories and rationales of the anemias of decreased production. So now all we got to do is talk about the things that cause the opposite of anemia now. And that the general word for that is polycytemia. Get it? Poly meaning many and cytemia meaning uh, cells. Just like poly ticks. Poly means many and ticks are blood sucking parasites. So you know what politicians are, don't you? Okay. Oh, we know you're all laughing with the muted microphones. Let's go into the concept of polycytemia. All that means is you have uh, a high hemoglobin, a high hematocrit rather than low. And it could be relative. For example, if I took your blood and I just evaporated some of the water, it would look like your red cells were more uh, than, you know, 50% uh, on the hematocrit, wouldn't it? It would look like you were the opposite of anemia. But that's just a uh, phenomenon that doesn't occur too often in real life. Uh, absolutely means you just have too many red cells. Well, there's basically two reasons you could have too many red cells. One of them is a myeloproliferative state called polycytemia vera. It's vera means true. So in these uh, polycytemias, you have a proliferation of the marrow. 
That's what myeloproliferative means. On the other hand, there are many other myeloproliferative diseases, which we're going to discuss in the next chapter. But the hallmark of polycythemia vera is that they have a low EPO or a low erythropoietin because they just don't have, even though they have a, a large number of red cells, it is not being fed by a high erythropoietin. In other words, it's not under normal physiologic hemostasis control. Most of the other polycythemias have high EPO. So in other words, if you were to increase a person's EPO or uh, renal erythropoietin by virtue of the fact that they live in a high altitude and they have to produce more red cells to deliver more oxygen to oxygen thin atmospheres, that would do it. That's normal physiologic thing. On the other hand, there are some tumors that produce EPO as a um, uh, perineoplastic syndrome and renal tumors often produce EPO. So that could do it as well. Another thing is if you remember some of the uh, Olympic athletes were being busted because they were injecting EPO so they could have more oxygen, so they could perform a little bit better in some of their feats. And also I want to tell you, I was even involved with a project called CVAC, which is cyclical variations and altitude conditioning. And what that does is uh, they have these little uh, trendy bubble pods. I guess a lot of them are in California. I don't know if Jessica has ever seen one, but they put people inside these little bubbles and they simulate the pressure in that. So it's high altitude. And because of that, it kicks in your own intrinsic EPO. So that's a way of doping your EPO without uh, taking the um, artificial stuff, which can be detected in, in by uh, drug testing. When you're boosting your own intrinsic EPO, it's the same exact amino acid sequence as your normal ones. Whereas the doping one had a couple of amino acids differently. So they know if you're, you know, cheating on the Olympics. P. vera is a myeloproliferative disease. And you have to remember, it's not just red cell precursors. It's also white cell precursors. That's why it's called myeloproliferative. It's the whole marrow. It's not just red cells. And it's also, but it is manifested primarily as uh, a lot of uh, increased hemoglobin. So if the normal hemoglobin is, let's say, 45, if the normal crit is around 15, you can have hemoglobins of 55, 60 even, you know, and you could have crits, you know, correspondingly about one third of that. And it's a myeloproliferative disease. And we're going to go into myeloproliferative disease. We talk about white cells. Some people consider certain myeloproliferative diseases also to be pre-leukemic. But uh, there, this one does not have a high incidence of leukemia. Some of the other ones do, like chronic myelogenic leukemia has a, uh, a significant risk of developing into a, acute leukemia. P. vera is not nearly as associated with uh, leukemias as some of the other ones. Okay, so we're done with anemias of increased destruction, decreased production, and the polycythemia states. Let's actually go into now the so-called bleeding disorders because we, got, we can't ignore platelets, remember? And platelets are the primary consideration in bleeding disorders. Uh, so if we're going to do white cells in the next chapter and we're doing red cells with this chapter, we have to throw in platelets somewhere. So that's where we're throwing in. We're throwing them in at the end of chapter 13. Uh, think of it functionally again and logically and anatomically. Why would people bleed? Well, one reason they bleed is that they have something wrong with their blood vessels and therefore their blood vessels are leaking or, you know, getting holes in them or not having enough uh, anatomic uh, histologic integrity. Another reason to bleed is to have reduced platelets. Another reason to bleed is to have normal platelets, but the platelets aren't working well functionally. These are called the qualitative platelet disorders, whereas these are the quantitative platelet disorders. And generally, if your platelets are, if the normal platelet count is between 150 to 300, which is usually the normal range, 
If you only have a hundred, that's probably okay. If you have 50, that's, you know, kind of of concern. If you have lower than 25, there's a good chance you'll be bleeding to spontaneously, even to death. So remember those little numbers. Another reason to have a bleeding disorder is to have normal platelets and normal blood vessel walls, but you have your so-called abnormal clotting factors of which, you know, the hemophilias A and B and a few other things are important. And probably the single most important common uh, clotting factor disorder is something called a von Willebrand's deficiency. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I don't think I've ever seen a board where they didn't have a... uh, a Von Willebrand patient on there. I don't know, probably because it's the most common uh, clotting disorder. Another thing to remember is that when you have the DIC, so-called consumption coagulopathy, you have normal platelets, but they're being all trapped up in diffuse clots all over your body. And therefore the amount that you can use peripherally is very small. So a DIC patient, whereas they're throwing thromboses, all over their body, the amount of residual platelets left is very, very small. So they can be also hemorrhaging to death as well. If you look at blood vessel wall abnormalities and you just want to think anatomically, remember we told you that amyloid in its early stages is primarily building up in blood vessels. There's a condition called telangiectasia or abnormal dilatation. There are, there's an autoimmune disease called Henoch Shanlein purpura. It's also associated with a glomerular deposits of stuff in the blood vessels. If you remember, we talked about the so-called uh, collagen diseases of which Ehlers-Danlos was one of them and scurvy, abnormal collagen on the basis of vitamin C deficiency, Cushing syndrome, very, very delicate blood vessels. Uh, when we go into dermatology, we'll talk about certain drug reactions causing damages to the blood vessels. And remember, there's a lot of, uh, uh, especially the gram-negative bacteria, but including meningococcus and rickettsia, they do a lot of dam. They have uh, toxins which are very, very damaging to blood vessels. So in this case, you got the common denominator for all these conditions is that you have abnormal, delicate, damaged, fragile blood vessels, which are going to be leaking blood even if your platelets are normal. But let's get to the big thing. Let's get to platelets. If you remember, we spent the last 72 hours talking about decreased production or increased destruction of white cells. Well, the same principles with platelets too. You can have a thrombocytopenia on the basis of increased destruction or decreased production as well, just like we talked about with uh, red cells. You can also sequester your platelets. In other words, if you have hypersplenism, your spleen is working overtime because maybe it's congested from a cirrhosis, let's say, you could then be trapping a lot of thrombocytes or platelets there and therefore causing a of thrombocytopenia peripherally, even though your total number is correct. And also, once again, remember, it's all a dilutional thing. So technically, if your blood was very, very, very diluted, relatively speaking, your number of platelets would be low. And I would say, I don't normally like people to memorize numbers, but you're going to probably know this anyway, if you've seen a few CBCs, normal platelets are 150 to 300. Is 100 bad? Nah. Is 400 bad? No, maybe not even 500. But once you're over about four or five, that's, you know, thrombocytosis. And uh, that's not good. And remember, even if you have 50K platelets, you're probably going to be okay. But you, you just should be worried. And if it falls below 25, that's what you usually, the hematologists freak out. When the patients are below 25, that's when they want to give them platelet transfusions. Okay, what are the conditions which cause a decreased production of platelets? Well, we already know one, the aplastic anemias, remember? We said everything was wiped out, not just reds. Also, when you have an acute leukemia, your marrow is so packed by the leukemia blast cells, it causes a relative pushing out or underproduction of platelets. 
Uh, is alcohol toxic to platelets? You bet. The thiazides uh, toxic to platelets often. And of course, chemo. Remember, chemo uh, zaps all normal cells in your body. Some of the viruses, like measles patients and AIDS patients, often are thrombocytopenic. And remember, we said with megaloblastic anemias, you have inadequate production of all cell lines. We said not only reds, but also whites and also platelets. So that's another situation. And don't forget, in a lot of these so-called myelodysplastic syndromes, in which you have a pre-leukemia situation present or a situation which is often associated with an uh, oncoming leukemia, that is also a, a situation for decreased uh, platelet production, just like the acute leukemias. What are the situations of increased destruction? Well, the most common one, and you'll see a lot of cases of this, what they call ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, their platelets are low because their bodies are making antibodies against them and they're destroying them faster, right? Another thing to remember is that a lot of times post-transfusion, especially in neonates, uh, they'll get decreased platelets for the same reason. The three big drugs, which are, uh, even though I could probably make you a list of 50, I want to tell you the three big ones are the anti-malarials, the sulfa antibiotics, and heparin thrombocytopenia is very, very, very common. Once again, the EB virus, the HIV virus. Remember, we have HIV indicted not only with decreased production, but also increased destruction. DIC is increased destruction. Why? Because those platelets are being trapped up in small thrombi all over the body. There's another condition similar to ITP or idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura called TTP. And rather than being idiopathic, it's thrombotic. So their platelets are being used up because they're forming little thrombi all over the place. And those are being destroyed faster as well. And of course, remember, there's the concept of microangiopathic thrombocytopenia due to increased destruction. And why is that? It's because if you have a disease of small blood vessels or microangiopathic, not only can they result, these little thrombi, in the, in the physical disruption and destruction of red cells, but they can also result in the physical disruption and destruction of platelets as well. So I hope this has been kind of a logical category. And now we'll just go into the classical thrombocytopenias. Well, there's ITP, which is the most common adult primary thrombocytopenia. There's acute immune. That is the most common cause of thrombocytopenia in kids. In this case, they're technically both autoimmune, but the one in kids behaves more like a viral type infection. It goes away you know, after a few weeks, like a viral infection. Whereas an adult, they normally don't, and they have to be treated by steroids. And actually both of them are, uh, you know, sometimes have to be treated by steroids. The drug induced thrombocytopenias are just due to the fact that some drugs we've already named them, uh, are associated with damaging platelets. We said the anti, a lot of antibiotics, the anti-malarials, and especially heparin. And remember, HIV not only interferes with platelet production, but it's also associated with platelet destruction. So remember, HIV, with all the things we said about it so far, think thrombocytopenia as well. And here's a, a two conditions which are related, and they're also similar to what we would call the microangiopathic ones. And you could probably put DIC in the same category because in all these categories, you have small thrombi uh, practically everywhere in the body. And of course, if this winds up being kidneys and brain, you know, you're in deep trouble. But whenever you have a situation in which you're small, forming small thrombi all over your body, that's going to be sucking up the platelets too, isn't it? And therefore causing a thrombocytopenia. Let's talk about the most common 
thrombocyte acquired thrombocytopenia in adults, ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Patient comes in, adult or elderly, they have decreased platelets, they don't know why. Uh, they could have, have ha happened acutely or chronically, most likely chronically. Most likely it's an autoimmune disease in which their platelets are attacking their antibody, uh, their platelets, antibodies are attacking their platelets. So what do you do? Well, you go to the lab and you order anti-platelet antibodies. And if they're positive, you've got your diagnosis cinched. If they're negative, they still may have ITP, but usually the antiplatelet antibodies are positive. And think about this now. If you are destroying your platelets because the antibodies are covering them, you're destroying your platelets faster than you should, you are probably normally physiologically reacting to that by having an increased number of marrow megakaryocytes. So here's the general rule, just like what red cells. If you're destroying your red cells too fast, you have an erythroid hyperplasia. If you're destroying your platelets too fast, you have a hyperplasia of your megakaryocytes, right? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, for some reason, because most of these are autoimmune and steroids decrease the attraction between antibodies and antigens, and they're using a lot of autoimmune diseases. Uh, steroids are still the main, considered the main type of treatment for ITP. And remember, these are adults. And in kids, it's usually an acute syndrome. It usually follows a viral illness, and they also have antiplatelet antibodies. So whether the virus is causing it or whether uh, it's something that follows after a viral disease, remember we said, a lot of the autoimmune diseases follow viral illnesses. And uh, they can be given steroids, but usually in a kid that has a thrombocytopenia, unless they are dangerously low, like below 25, they usually return to normal in a, a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Okay, once again, here's the big drugs. You should remember that cause uh, thrombocytopenia sulfa, anti-malarials, and heparin. Heparin's in the biggest font because it's the most common thing in this country. HIV interferes with both production as well as uh, accelerating destruction of platelets. And let's talk about the last situation now, the thrombotic microangiopathies. Think of that as exactly what it is. If you have a disease of a small blood vessel or a microangiopathy, and there's thrombi going on in there, it's going to consume platelets. And that's why this is called a consumptive coagulopathy. And not only are there, not only are platelets consumable uh, factors in coagulation, but so many of the blood coagulation factors are too, notoriously factor eight. So, a lot of patients that have decreased factor eight are not necessarily genetic hemophiliacs. They have decreased factor eight because the uh, factor is being consumed by thrombotic microangiopathies. And TTP is a good example. And hemolytic uremic syndrome is also in that same category. Let's talk about the qualitative platelet disorders now. We've already talked about the situations that are causing too few platelets. Let's talk about situations in which the platelets are not too few. They're normal in number. They're between 150 and 300, but they're not working. Well, that's why it's called a qualitative platelet disorder. And I don't want to get into the complex genetics of this or a lot of the you know so-called classical syndromes, but I think you should know that there is a syndrome called Bernard Soulier. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. It's once again, it's a, it's a problem. It's a genetic condition in which you have a, a deficiency of a glycoprotein 1B, but that will result in a platelet being normal in number, but not working properly. There's another situation called Glanzman's thrombostenia, 
in which you have a deficiency of glycoprotein 2B and 3A. And that's another example of a qualitative platelet disorder. Uh, and I'll also remember uh, in storage pool, disorder, there's also situations, if you remember when we talked about platelets in uh, pathology one, we talked about various things that platelets do, like they degranulate, they adhere, they coagulate, they degranulate. But there's a situation in which they could still misfunction even after they degranulate generically. So these are all situations. Remember Bernard Soulier, remember Glansman's as classical qualitative platelet disorders. However, that's only 1% of qualitative platelet disorders. Here's the other 99% right here. Aspirin, aspirin and aspirin are the top three reasons for a qualitative platelet disorder. Because what does aspirin do? It keeps platelets from sticking to each other. And you all know this concept about COX-1 and COX-2 and the different receptors. And that's why you can't go to the drugstore anymore and buy a $2 bottle of aspirin. You have to buy something that's a specific COX inhibitor and pay $50 a bottle. So just remember, even though aspirin is still a really good drug and is still used very often as a mainstay for arthritis, I give Sandy two aspirins a day. I've been doing it for years. It really helps her hips. Uh, but also remember, even if you are on one aspirin a day, it's going to completely screw up your platelet aggregation tests. There are tests to see how well in the lab, there are tests in the lab to see how well your platelets stick to each other. And if they're not sticking to each other well, it's probably because they're not functioning well. And for 99% of the time, the reason for that is that the patients are on aspirin. And, you know, I just went to visit the dean of my old medical school last week, and he told me the story of a friend of his that died because this guy was a, a renowned doctor. He was an older guy. He went in for surgery. He forgot to tell him that he was on aspirin, and he bled to death during surgery because they didn't know he was on aspirin. So if you want to, that's why even if taking for a male like me or Chuck perhaps who takes one baby aspirin a day, you might think that's not very much but it's enough to keep your aspirins from uh, sticking to each other too much. Okay, let's talk now about clotting deficiencies because you can't talk about platelet disorder, you can't talk about coagulation dis uh, disorders and only platelets. When you have thrombocytopenia and it falls below 25, you're bleeding will be spontaneous. It'll occur for no reason. However, if you have a clotting factor deficiency, if you remember this whole clotting tree from all the different factors, uh, it's very likely you're not going to be ble bleeding unless you've had like either surgery or trauma and the thing just doesn't stop bleeding. So in a clotting factor deficiency, clinically, you are going to probably not stop bleeding after the bleeding has already started normally from either trauma or surgery. But with a platelet disorder or thrombocytopenia, you're going to bleed even if there is no surgery or trauma. And remember, you, theoretically, when you go into all of these factors we talked about, uh, any factor deficiency will result in a clotting disorder. But, you know, factor eight and nine are the most classical ones. <clears throat> and that's why they're called hemophilias A and B, respectively. And remember... They are, uh, you can, there are several uh, factors, two, seven, nine, ten that are dependent on vitamin K. So if you have a vitamin K deficiency, that would be an example of a, an acquired coagulation disorder due to lack of vitamin K. And also remember that factor eight and nine are hemophilias A and B respectively, because there are just remarkable similarities between the two disease. Also remember that all of these clotting deficiencies are really nothing. They're very, very minor compared to the single most common bleeding disorder of clotting deficiency called von Willebrand's disease. And von Willebrand's factor is not a separate clotting factor in itself like factor eight or factor nine is. 
but it's another factor that helps factor eight do its job. So even though you could have normal factor eight, if you don't have von Willebrand's factor, you could have what looks like a hemophilia. That's why the old name for von Willebrand's disease is called pseudo hemophilia. So what's von Willebrand's disease? Well, it's really common. You know, 1% of us has it. That's an amazingly high percentage. And like all the other coagulation things, it's usually after wound bleeding, but it could be spontaneous. But classically remembered, the coagulation factor bleeding is usually after surgery or trauma. It's usually an autosomal dominant, but as you might guess, it has amazingly complex genetics. And I don't think we should kill ourselves with the genetics of a lot of these diseases. If I say complex genetics, I guarantee you they're not going to expect you to know it on the boards. The most best common way to detect von Willebrand's disease, as well as most of the other coagulation, is a bleeding time. And what does that mean? It means you make a little nick in the patient's skin and you blot it every 30 seconds or every minute. And when it stops blotting, that's the bleeding time. And normally that's just, you know, a couple minutes, you know, maybe five minutes. I forget the normal ranges, but a prolonged bleeding time is somebody who's still clotting, you know, even after 10, 15 minutes. So what is von Willebrand factor? It is a protein. It complexes with factor eight and it's together called the uh, von Willebrand complex. And if you have a defective von Willebrand factor, it won't let factor eight work properly. And also in von Willebrand's disease, there are usually platelet disorders as well. So you have to remember not only is there gonna, is factor eight not gonna be working because it can't complex with von Willebrand factor, but very often there's a, an associated platelet thing as well. Okay, so much for von Willebrand's. Let's talk about the classical hemophilias. Let's talk about hemophilia A and B. Well, if you remember, they're both sex linked, which means they're only in males. Uh, there is a gene which codes for factor eight. It's mutated, so you don't make enough. And once again, the hemorrhage is usually not spontaneous. It usually recurs, occurs after a surgery or bleeding normally starts. There's a wide variety of symptoms. Bleeding into the bones is, and joints is very, very common. And the main test that you want to do to detect hemophilia A, just like B, is the PTT. Remember, that's the thing that measures the intrinsic coagulation side of the equation, the one on the left, the one that is not associated with tissue factor. So a prolonged PTT is a hallmark of hemophilia A. How do you treat it? Well, you can now make a recombinant factor eight, and that's how you treat it. And guess what? We're now going to go to hemophilia B, and it's going to look exactly the same. It's also sex links refective, except in this case, it's a decrease of factor nine. It's also called Christmas hemophilia, not because it was discovered on Christmas Day, because the first patient that was described and was named Christmas. Uh, hemorrhage is usually not spontaneous again. It's usually after a surgery. It's also a wide variety. And once again, it's a PTT test. That's basic, basically only the PTT without the defect in the PT or what they now call INR. The prolonged PTT is the main test for it, main abnormality. And how do you treat it? Well, same way you treated A. Rather than recombinant eight, you now got recombinant nine. We talked about DIC uh, in many different uh, points of view, but let's talk about it again. It's a very serious situation. It's associated with uh, major diseases. It's associated with difficult deliveries. It's associated with widespread shock, widespread infection, widespread malignancies. It has a very, very high mortality. And remember, when you have a DIC and you're forming little clots all over your body, that's not only going to consume platelets, but it's also going to consume the consumable clotting factors. And even though I told you eight and nine are consumable, there's others, but classically, uh, factor eight is the classical consumable 
factor. In other words, if you start using it, it's going to have a defect. Whereas some of the other cl clotting factors is once you start forming clots, you're not going to see a relative decrease in function of, or in amount of the other stuff. But in factor eight, you will. Okay, so DIC is a classical example of a consumptive coagulopathy. We said it's popular in widespread infections, especially meningococcus, Rocky Mountain spotted femur, fungal infections, malaria. It's the major fear in extremely difficult OB complications of all types. Uh, it's the major fear in patients, not only with leukemias, but many widespread neoplasms. Any patient that's severely injured, trauma, burn, surgery, uh, is going to have DIC. And that's why DIC has such a high mortality, because if you look at the conditions which predispose to it, they have a high mortality just by themselves, don't they? Last but not least, let's say one word about the common coagulation tests. We talked about the PTT, like we said before in the chapter on coagulation, that it measures the intrinsic side of the coagulation scheme. We said that the PT, which is now called the INR, measures the function of the extrinsic part of the coagulation cascade, the one in which tissue factor is the major component. Uh, another common thing that you'll uh, do on every patient, whether you like it or not, is a platelet count because it's part of every CBC. If you suspect the patient has uh, normal platelet counts, but they're not working, then you do a platelet aggregation test. We talked about the bleeding time being very, very easy to do, and that's, you know, elevated in von Willebrand's disease. You can do assays for fibrinogen. Actually, you could do assays for any of the coagulation factors, but if you were to be on a hospital committee and they ask you to establish a coagulation panel for all your post-op surgery patients, you'd probably want to do almost all of these things except for factor assays. So classically, uh, you uh, most pre-op patients will get these tests just to make sure they're going to be coagulating properly. Because even if they're on aspirin, they may have a problem with aggregation, wouldn't they? Okay, we're done. I felt like I did a pretty good job today. We're gonna have a really good time today. We finished in three hours, just like I thought. However, Margaret, yeah, yeah. I want you to give us a 10 minute break and then we're gonna do a couple of fun things in lab, okay? Okay. Okay, okay but before you do that, mm -hmm. I know I everybody was nice enough to mute their microphone. But I have to know if there was somebody who could not hear me or see the PowerPoints well. So here's the question. Could everybody see and hear well today? Okay, sound off, everybody. Yes, 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 yes. If there's a no out there, don't let me. Uh, okay. Okay, well, uh, uh, Auntie Margaret. Yes. Why don't you call us in uh, 10 minutes and we're going to do a couple of quick lab cases. Okay, great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Thank you.
Okay, time flies when you're having fun. Are we back? We're back. <laughs> All's quiet. Hello. Marco, why do you always spoil our fun? Just when we <laughs> got the hell out of this stinking class, you I always know. make some. It, it's like that guy in the Godfather's. Just when I'm trying to get out, you pull me back in. <laughs> <laughs> I think Michael Corleone said that in one of the Godfathers. And they also did a takeoff of it in the movie Goodfellas, which is like one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, we, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm having fun. I'm really, really still having fun doing this. I, I, I had a teacher in uh, pathology that like is all time genius. I'll never, ever, ever, ever be as good as he is. And all I can tell you is that whenever I went to his classes, man, it was like going to a movie. You just didn't want it to end. He was so good. You, you got up after he was done and it was like the time passed by like a flash and you go, Oh man, I want more. And I, I decided I've given up a long time ago trying to figure out how to make classes fun, but at least I learned how to make classes fun for myself. So I'm having fun. I, I went to My Fair Lady last night. It's a, a music, a really good musical <coughs> they have here at the Lincolnshire Theater, just north of Chicago. We saw My Fair Lady, and uh, that's why I put in that movie about uh yeah it is a, mar a modern pygmalion one of the uh, statements on the uh david letterman top 10 list was you never know what a man is really like until you quit putting money in his pocket <laughs> and that's the number one principle about all medical partnerships Anyway, the guy that told me this was a guy that was screwed badly by a radiology group in, uh, in Maryland, and his name was Tom Cubberly, and I'll never forget him. I lost track with him, but he was a very nice, friendly, smart guy. I'm sure he's made a zillion dollars in radiology, but he got really screwed badly. So when I heard that song, Wouldn't It Be Loverly, I'm thinking... If I think of all the things that Tom Cubberly told me, I could probably sing a song to him one day and say, wouldn't that be Cubberly? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's do a little bit of lab. And I figured out uh, a couple of things we could do in lab that will uh, kind of instantly reinforce the things we've been talking about. Now, if you remember, be when we were doing general path, there was not really that much opportunity to follow up on a lot of our things with uh, labs. But now that we're in systems, we're going to have a few things that we talk about in every chapter that we could instantly show you a few cases of. For example, I use the example of pancreas. We do the small pancreas chapter. We'll show you maybe one good case of a pancreatitis in the lab and one good case of a, of a pancreatic carcinoma and talk about the clinical and lab features of those. With RBCs, I mean, this is great. I mean, RBC, hematology is almost entirely lab. In fact, it's not even histology, it's smear. So I went to the part of our lab that was for red cells, and unfortunately, there weren't too many smears, you know, right stained smears, but there were a few nice H&E pictures. I got three of them I wanted to show you. And uh, there were the only smears that were there were mostly for the white cell disorders. And I don't want to get into the white cell disorders yet. So we're going to go back to our regular microscope here under histopath and go to our FPX files. And I have uh, three cases I want to show you. And the first one is an absolute beautiful visual example of every thing we have been talking about. It's slide number K207. And I'm not even going to tell you the name of it, but I'm sure in about six seconds, everybody will see it. And uh, you're probably saying, well, this looks like all that other crap that I saw, just red dots and pink dots and blue dots. Well, I think if once we look a little bit closer, I know that the original picture is going to take about eight seconds for everybody to see. So I suspect now almost everybody is looking at these little 
purple and pink dots and uh, pink strips and everything. And you're probably saying, what the hell is it? Well, I think I could show you pretty quickly what the hell it is. Because if you remember, these things here are bone spicules, aren't they? And if you look closely, they have these little osteoblasts rimming them on the outside of the spicule. And once they are trapped up inside the bone, they are then osteocytes. But look, more importantly, between these spicules, you see a lot of cells. And I don't think I'd have a hard time convincing any of you that this is a bone marrow. But the first thing you're going to say is, you know, Menarsic is nuts. This can't be a bone marrow. He told us bone marrows were 50% fat. Well, I did. But this bone marrow is only about 10% fat. You see, you got spaces here and here and here. It's only about 10, maybe 15, 20 at the most. So this is a hypercellular marrow, isn't it? Now, if the two things I want to point out, not only for this marrow, but every marrow, is we have to go back to the concepts of cellularity and ME ratio. Cell it normal cellularity for an adult axial skeleton bone marrow, hematopoietic bone marrow, is 50%. So if you see something, even though you don't know what the hell these cells are, if you see something where it's only 10 or 20% fat rather than 50, you know that there's hypercells. So the first thing that should strike your mind is this is bone and there's not much fat in the marrow. Those mostly cells. So bingo, that means hypercellular. Now, why is it hypercellular? Are there too many reds or are there too many whites? Well, let's blow it up a little bit and see if we can get a better handle on that. So I'm going to blow up this part here. And once again, in about six seconds, everybody will see it. And once again, you can see these osteocytes within the spicules. This could be from an iliac crest or a sternum or a, even a, technically a skull or a vertebral body. But this is adult axial red hematopoietic marrow. And you can see the osteoblasts here, and you can see the osteocytes trapped up. Now, what are all these cells? And remember, we're still not really zoomed in very far. But remember what I told you. Not only do you now clearly understand the concept of cellularity, but you must understand the concept of ME ratio. ME ratio is the ratio of myeloid cell precursors that have open nuclei to erythroid cell precursors, which have small, round, dense nuclei. It's normally about three to one. Could it be four to one? I guess. Could it be five to one? I guess. But if it's much less than that or much more than that, there's something going on. So if you have a marrow that is hypercellular, which this is, and you have determined that the vast majority of these cells are small, round erythroid cells, then you don't have an ME ratio that is lowered on the basis of decreased myeloid cells, but you have an ME ratio that's lowered on the basis of increased erythroid cells. So remember, it's all relative. And I just zoomed in a big part over here, and I bet I could get you to believe that almost every one of the cells, maybe 80, 90% of the cells in this field, even though you can see some of them look like they might be neutrophils, they're basically small, round, all throughout here. So this is an ME ratio that is reversed, isn't it? It's a hypercellular marrow, and the ME ratio is reversed. And it is reversed because there is a proliferation of erythroid cells. And this marrow is quite representative of every single type of anemia that we talked about on Tuesday. Because we said that in the hemolytic anemias, there is an erythroid 
hyperplasia. That's all I want to say. And if you understand what I just said in the last five minutes, this is crucial to assessing all bone marrows. Remember that one of the third things I said is that when you look at a bone marrow, you should also quickly assess whether you have megakaryocytes around or not. So I'm just going to make one more zooming picture here. And I'm going to take like an average field, like let's say this. And oh, maybe I got to blow it up a little bit more. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure in a few seconds everybody will see. But can you recognize this as being a megakaryocyte? Yeah, because it's so much bigger than everything else. Could you recognize this as being a megakaryocyte? Yeah. Could you recognize this as probably being a megakaryocyte? Yeah. So in every high power field, you should like to see hopefully at least one or two megakaryocytes. Let's say that let's say that this is the normal of megakaryocytes in a high power field, just theoretically. And let's say rather than average of two or three per every field, you were seeing four or five. That would be a megakaryocytic hyperplasia, wouldn't it be? And the most common cause of a megakaryocytic hyperplasia would be a thrombocytopenia of increased destruction using the same principle that the erythroid hyperplasia is caused by an anemia of increased destruction. If a person had low platelets and a megakaryocytic hyperplasia, that's because the platelets are being destroyed too quickly. If a person had low platelets and a decreased number of megakaryocytes, that would probably be due to decreased. Hey, 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 incoming call from Margaret Alvarez. And you have to understand ME ratio. Thank you. This is really the main case I wanted to show you, but I have another case I want to show you. It's called slide number 4206. And this is going to be a real easy one. What is this? Well, we don't even have to go any higher power on this. I think most of you really, even though you're not speaking up, I know that already most of you kind of think, well, yeah, this looks like a spleen because I see all of these uh, white pulp areas or these lymphoid areas that look like secondary follicles like here and here and here. And there's about 20 of them all over the place. But 80 or 90% of this cross-sectional field is red pulp. Now, do you remember I told you that the normal spleen has about 50% red and 50% white? And the red is red because it's staining red microscopically. But, but the white is white because it looks white. So if you have a spleen in which there's a preponderance of red pulp, would you say that Perhaps the reason there's such a preponderance of red pulp is that the red pulp is proliferating and working over time. This is a spleen of hemolytic anemia, isn't it? It's a spleen in which the red cells are being destroyed at a much faster rate, and therefore they need more red pulp. In fact, it's probably not surprising at all if I was to tell you that the treatment for many of hemolytic anemias, especially things like spherocytosis, is a splenectomy. Because if you cut out that spleen, that's going to lengthen the life of those red cells, and they won't be hemolyzing so badly. 
So that's why the splenectomies are done in a wide variety of hemolytic anemias. Okay, last case is going to be slide number K8. And this is also going to be a quick one. And I'm going to show you K8. And what if I told you, for example, that this was also a spleen? Well, the first thing you would say is, you're out of your mind. This is not a spleen. There's no red pulp. There's no white pulp. It all looks like just regular old fibrous tissue. This can't possibly be a spleen. Well, it is a spleen. I'm telling you, it's a spleen. But you don't see much by way of red pulp. You don't see many lymphoid areas. It looks like it's all scarred, doesn't it? It looks like you got blood vessels that are thick. It looks like there's a lot of collagen. In fact, if I told you this was a total splenic infarct, you might believe me then, wouldn't you? Because you know that infarction, especially long-term infarction, is replacement of tissue by uh, scars, by fibrous tissue. So this is a long-term total infarct of the spleen. And remember, we said that in sickle cell disease, you have chronic microinfarcts and what they call autosplenectomy. So this is a sickle cell patient that had long-term disease. If you remember in the beginning part of the disease where there's a lot of hemolysis, the spleen could actually be enlarged, but with the uh, progression of uh, infarcts, microinfarcts for years, eventually that normal 150 gram spleen might wind up being 50, 25, or even less, or even gone almost. So those are the three histo cases I wanted to show you for lab. And now I'm going to try to do something else. And I hope it works because I have to go to a website. And the website that I'm going to go to is at the bottom of this uh, slide here. It's called Chronolab. And I found a really nice place that has a lot of interesting, uh, whoops, you don't want to go to my dictionary, do you? We're going to go to a place that has a lot of very, very nice common red cell disorders that you see in hematology lab all the time. And, you know, when the uh, medical students and the residents rotate through hematology, you know, they wind up looking at the hematology microscopes at peripheral smears and bone marrows, and they wind up looking at them with a double-headed scope with one of the uh, pathology jocks who considers himself a hematology expert. So now you're going to be looking at the microscope with me, only these are pictures that are already taken, and they're really nice. And look at, does everybody here see the apps? Whoops, I screwed up, didn't I? I accidentally closed that because I hit the wrong button. So I'm going to do it again. Uh, I'm just going to make that smaller. I'm not going to make it disappear. Does everybody see the nice, beautiful, normal, round, normal, cytic, normal, chromic, slightly central pallor red cells? Absolutely. It looks really, really nice. This is what you should be seeing. And... Uh, Let's take a look at a situation now of the maturation. If you remember, we had the so-called stem cells, which would give rise to anything in the marrow. And then you went into the red differentiation. So you had a pro-erythroblast. And then you had a basophilic erythroblast in which the cytoplasm is very basophilic. And then you had one called polychromatophilic erythroblast in which the cytoplasm was kind of neutral grayish. And then you had something called an acetophilic or eosinophilic or orthochromic in which the cytoplasm is almost as red as a normal uh, red blood cell. This, this could also be called a nucleated red cell. And if you remember, we said that rit reticulocytes are just remnants of nuclear material may be present in very, very young erythrocytes too. So this is the normal maturation. And whether you're calling these erythroblasts or normal blasts or rubroblasts, because there's various nomenclatures, just remember the general principle is the nucleus gets smaller 
and denser, and the cytoplasm goes from blue to red. And the final result, so that is extruded, you then in the peripheral smell have your classical uh, erythrocyte. Okay, this is the uh, level at with which erythropoietin works on this differentiation scheme. You should remember that erythropoietin works at multiple levels in the differentiation of red cells. Uh, here's another picture I hope you can get pre pretty soon. <coughs> There's some more classical differentiation in the bone marrow. This is the uh, same thing that we saw before. Nucleus getting smaller. Uh, cytoplasm going from blue to red. And the end result is that this nucleus is very dense then. So in the white series, the nucleus is still very uh, open. But in the red series, it's dense. And that's how you could tell the difference as a quick ME ratio assessment. There's a reticulocyte. The reason it doesn't look as blue uh, I mean, as pink as the other ones, it, it's usually you can't see reticulocytes too well under a regular right stain. So they do a supra-vital stain of various types. Uh, and that's when you see little particles nicely. That's how you could count reticulocytes. And you know that the normal reticulocyte percentage would be not more than 1%. So if you have a large number of reticulocytes, it means that the red cells are being released into the peripheral blood too quickly. And the reason they are being released too quickly, usually, is that they're being destroyed too quickly. So the hemolytic anemias frequently have mm. increased reticulocytes. Yeah. Here's a great looking mature erythrocyte, like we saw before. Keep that in mind as your normal. Even though you don't see a couple platelets there, you're in a real zoomed in area. So if you ever see a beautiful thing on a smear that looks like it's all beautiful uh, red cells, remember, just find a few platelets around every now and then. That way you'll be, you won't miss a thrombocytopenia. Mm -hmm. There's hemoglobin molecule, two alphas, two betas, the heme in the middle. Remember that? Okay. There's some more introduction to bone marrow. We went from these uh, cells all, all the way to the mature erythrus. This is a pro-erythroblast. You could tell it's in the red series because the nucleus is very dark and the cytoplasm is very blue. And look how the nucleus is so much bigger than the, the diameter of a red cell. Whereas as that matures more and the cytoplasm goes from blue to red, that nucleus will get smaller and denser. That's what you call the normal maturation pattern. It's a synchronization between the development of the cytoplasm and the nucleus. When you have uh, megaloblastic anemias and other abnormal uh, situations like dysplastic, myelodysplastic syndromes, you don't have a nice synchronized maturation. The cytoplasm doesn't change in synchrony with the nucleus as nicely as it should. There's a basophilic erythroblast. It's very, very blue. If it's a blast, you should be seeing a nucleolus there somewhere. Here's a polychromatophilic, which means it's kind of grayish. It's not, the cytoplasm is not blue. It's not as red as a red cell. It's kind of in that middle stage of what they call polychromatophilic. And here we go. He's, here's now what they call an acetophilic one, but these are also called eosinophilic, or the most uh, likely term for this would be nucleated red. And sometimes you see them in the peripheral smear, but you normally shouldn't. Another name for this is orthochromic. But basically, let's call it what it is. It's red. The cytoplasm is almost as red as a regular red cell. There's another reticulocyte. There's another nice normal group of erythrocytes. I hope that, uh, can I ask somebody a question? Is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch the field right now, and I want to know how long it takes for me to switch the field for somebody to see it. So as soon as I click on this little arrow here, I want the first person to tell me when they see the new picture. I just did it now. Okay, so it's a pretty quick response. That's good. That's good. Here Now, here you go. Let's talk about the megaloblastic anemias. Remember, we call these the B12 and folate ones. We said that there's defective 
a DNA synthesis uh, related to B12 uh, stuff is uh, folate as well. Well, they almost have the same maturation pattern as a regular erythroblast, except the nucleus and the whole cell is so much bigger. <clears throat> and also what they call a dyssynchrony between the maturation of the nucleus and the maturation of the cytoplasm. So as the nucleus gets smaller and denser, the cytoplasm gets less blue, and that should be in synchrony. But sometimes that synchronous condition doesn't happen. But that's a classical promegaloblast. Look how much bigger it is than your a red cell diameter. These are huge cells. There's a basophilic one. Remember, these are megaloblasts now. Look how big those nuclei are relative to the red cells. Here they are now going into the polychromatophilic and acidophilic stage, and they're still big, aren't they? Okay, there's a nucleated red, and even that nucleus is bigger than it should be. And once again, remember, if it's a true megaloblastic anemia, you're likely to have really, really huge neutrophils. Remember, big bands, big metamyelocytes, big uh, segmented cells. And also, they're going to be hyper-segmented. So rather than an average of three lobes per nucleus, you're going to get four or five. There's another reticulocyte that's megaloblastic, but who cares? There's a megalocyte. Now remember we said megalocytes were also called macrocytes. So if this is a normal 7.4 diameter red cell, these could be eight or nine. In this case, it's they say between seven and nine. But these are macrocytes, aren't they? So they have a large MCV. And if you average them all, all up, rather than the MC being 94, they could very easily be over 100. Okay, here's a concept called anisochromia. What does that mean? It means some cells are redder than normal and some cells are paler than normal. This is classical for a iron deficiency anemia. It's called anisochromia. It's also called... Um, Uh, that's probably the best name for it. Here's hypochromia, or cells with a low MCHC, because they're pale. It could very well be iron deficiency. Here's hyperchromia, or cells with a high MCHC. This would be in a situation where, for some reason, the hemoglobin is more concentrated in the cell than it should be. Here's another polychromia. Now, do you see how in these cells, a lot of them look kind of grayish rather than pinkish? Those are usually early released red cells. They may very well be reticulocytes if you do their reticulocyte stain, but a very, very early released red cell is a little bit grayer and not quite as pink as a regular cell. So once again, if there was a hemolytic process going on, and cells were be releasing earlier because they're being made faster, then you would see a lot of these polychromatophilic cells, wouldn't you? These are just terms that are commonly used. By the way, this term is also called, no, anisochromia is a good term. Here's something called anisocytosis. It means some cells are big, some cells are little. Now, what lab value would be increased with that situation? The RDW, right? Because there's a lot of variation in the size of the cells. Here's something called microcytosis again. It could be iron deficiency anemia or a thalassemia in some of the cells. If you don't believe that these are smaller than normal because they all look small and you all think this is relative, then just look at the patient's MCV. And if it's below about 80, Believe me, these are microcytes. Here's something called macrocytes again. All megaloblastic anemias show macrocytosis. So uh, these uh, persons had an MCV greater than uh, 95. Maybe it was 105, easily. Here's spherocytosis. Remember, we said that hereditary spherocytosis is when you lose the genes that code for your ankrin and spectrin, which are your uh, proteins that give the red cell shape. So when you lose them, they become little blobs and spheres, and they lose their central pallor. 
rather than having a nice bi con cave uh, disc. Here's something called an ovalocyte because they look oval. Or if you want to call them an elliptocyte because they're elliptical, you can. Here's a cell that's called a leptocyte. And actually, m almost nobody ever calls these leptocytes. They call them, by the way, they're more properly these cells target cells. You see a lot of cells like this called a target cell. And that, that brings me to another point. If you only see one target cell or one acanthocyte or one elliptocyte or one microcyte in an entire smear, please don't call it. So when you see these abnormalities in increased numbers, maybe a couple percent, for example, then you could call it. But I guarantee you, if you put your uh, blood under a smear right now and look at a million cells, you're going to find a few target cells, but don't call it leptocytosis. Generally speaking, there's a lot of conditions that cause target cells or leptocytosis. Liver disease is one of the more common ones. Here's an acanthocyte. Remember when we were in the skin, we said there's an acanthocyte in the skin, also called the prickle cell layer, because they have all these little jagged edges with the uh, desmosomes. Well, acanthocyte is something that looks like a little crab with all these little spikes on the outside. Maybe call it a punk cell if you want to. You know, I'm sure somebody's called us a punk cell at one time or another. Here's some more macrocytes. They're pretty big, aren't they? Here's poikilocytosis. And that means variations in shape. So... If some cells are round, but some cells are square, and some cells look like cigars, and some cells look like Idaho and New Jersey, that's like a lot of variation in shape, and that's called poikilocytosis. Here's something that looks like a sickle cell, and you could probably call it a sickle cell because it looks sickled, but don't forget, not everything that is a sickle is a sickle cell, and also never call a sickle cell if there's only one on the smear. Another name for this is drepanocytosis, but to tell you the truth, I have never heard that term in my life until reading this dialogue here. Here's a normal chromic, so it has a normal MCHC, or normal hemoglobin concentration. Here's hypochromic, decreased MCHC. Here's hyperchromic, or increased MCHC. Here's normal cells again. Here's a microcyte or low MCV. Here's a macrocyte or high MCV. Here's a spherocyte. These are probably microcytic as well, aren't they? That's due to the fact that they're no longer flat like Frisbees. They're round like golf balls because they lost their internal proteins that keep their shape. Here's an elliptocyte or an ovalocyte. And you know what? I don't think it's important right now for you to know all of the differential diagnoses of all these conditions. You know, if you wanted to be, you know, looking like you're a wise ass and you rattled off the differential diagnosis of ovalocytosis, I'd be impressed. But really, all you got to do is see one in the lab and then just Google it to see what are the common things that cause it. So I want to show you more the variation rather than the differential diagnosis. Here's a target cell. And if you want to read about it, they say they found in beta thalassemia. However, I could tell you, you also see them a lot in liver disease. Here's an acanthocyte, remember, the little punk cell. Here's another macrocyte. They call it a megalocyte, but I guarantee you that's the same as a macrocyte. It may have come from a megaloblast, but once it loses its nucleus, it's called a megalocyte or more, much more commonly termed uh, macrocyte. Stomatocytes, these are interesting. Uh, rather than having like a round uh, cavity, they have like a, a lip-shaped one. That's why they call them a mouth. They look like they're little things coming at you to kiss you. There's a lot of things that cause that. The most common thing is alcoholism. There's a schizocyte because somebody ripped it in its half and it's split, like a split personality or a schizophrenic, and therefore it looks like it's split. These are in a wide variety of conditions, but remember, 
if uh, you were mechanically chewing up those cells because of a heart valve or a DIC somewhere, you could see a lot of fragmentation of uh, cells. Here's a poikilocyte. Remember we said poikilocytes are variations from roundness. That's poikilocytosis. Here's a dacrocyte. Dacro is the root word for tear. That's why I have never heard this called a dacrocyte before. They're always called teardrop cells. And, you know, they're associated with a lot of things. But if you see a lot of teardrop cells, uh, you might think that there's myelofibrosis going on. But guess what, folks? We haven't talked about what myelofibrosis is yet. We said that there's a lot of myeloproliferative diseases, and we said that P. vera was one of them, but myelofibrosis is another one. My chief in nuclear medicine died of myelofibrosis a few years ago. Here's a Rolu formation. That's very important. In other words, the red cells are normal, but they seem to be stacked up like coins, and that's called Rolu with the silent X, French pronunciation, formation, rouleau formation. And the reason why it's important to recognize that is very often when you have increased gamma globulins in your blood, they for some reason cause your red cells to stack up like coins. So even though that could be an artifact due to the fact that the cells were just kind of hanging out at the dried edge of the cell, if you see like a lot of rouleau formation, you might want to say, uh-oh, does this patient have a multiple myeloma where you have tremendous proliferation of gamma globulins? Okay, you want to know something? I don't want to do any more. Plus, it's also quitting time. And there are a few more rare exotic things, but I think I gave you a mouthful for today. And I'm glad that a lot of it was repetitive. So I'm going to officially close down this web uh, page over here. And I'm going to ask um, Queen Margaret to mm -hmm. uh, give us permission to go home and have a good time now. Okay. Well, you we only had one small problem. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but Jessica um, could not get back into the Dim Dim meeting, and it said it was full. So I don't oh. know if we can um, increase the attendance limit on the meeting. That's something Jim said he would look into. Okay, I think yeah. uh, if I remember correctly, they said like 20 for the free version. Yeah. So we only had out. like about 13 or something, so. Mm -hmm. I kept on getting kicked out, and every time I tried to go back in, it would say the room was full. And just in the last 10 minutes, I got back in. Oh, I, I just remember why. I don't think I increased my time limit on it. Uh, because uh, I think I started before uh, 9 o'clock, and it's already... But everyone else would have got kicked out. Not um, Antoinette, I think, got also was kicked out, so I don't know. Maybe it is the time limit, and then because you 